Hello, everyone out there on the broadcast. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's great to have you here. Super excited to uh, have you watching the live stream. If you want to comment on stuff we're talking about, please put it in the live comment, the live chat, and we'll try to make it part of the show. And uh, yeah, with, with that said, Leon, you about ready to kick this off? Yeah, let's do this. All right. Leon, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's great to have you on. You're doing such interesting work in the community, and I'm I'm excited to just give you a chance to share the what you're doing with the world. It's it's cool what's going on over at Python Discord, and it's a lot bigger than I think people realize. Yeah, it's really take especially the last year. It's completely taken off. It's uh, it's quadrupled in size over the last year. And, wow. Uh, and that's uh, it's uh, we have 150,000 users now, a uh, hundred members of staff, and we're involved in all sorts of conferences and helping out in the ecosystem uh, overall. I think it's uh, it's starting to become a, a big deal. Yeah, I'm really yeah, I would say part of it. Yeah, I would say that's fantastic. Now, before we get into the main topic, let's hear a little bit about you and your background. Yeah, how do you get into programming in Python? Yeah. I, it's an interesting story. I, when I was six, my grandpa bought me my first computer and he was like a, uh, an autodidact. He like, he, um, he was into, he was an engineer at like, um, a petroleum engineer and he, he learned all sorts of stuff on his own time and he wanted me to get into computers and I started learning a little bit, but, uh, I never picked up programming because the consensus in the community where I grew up was like that programming was this thing that you needed academics to do. Okay, you yeah. needed that education, you needed that university background, whatever, like it was math, see, it was complicated. It's not something that a young person could do. And growing up in the 90s, that was a little bit more true then than it is now, but it still wasn't true. And so I went, I went a different way and I ended up in music. Um, I started studying music when I was a little older and I kind of gave up on my dreams of like being a computer engineer. Um, and, um, I even dropped out of school, never finished my education, uh, wanted to be a full-time musician. Um, that didn't work out. turns out it's not very well paid and you really have to <laughs> kind of get lucky to. Yeah. Uh, it's a tough one, right? It's fantastic <laughs> if you can make it, but it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. I gave it a good try. I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, but ultimately I, I went back to like it, uh, I did like guess, uh, customer support. I did like operations, stuff like that. And my, my sweetheart. Uh, my, my love, uh, she got me this book. This was like 14 years ago as almost like a joke for my birthday. She got me a C plus plus book. Um, like, I don't know what to get you, but you like computers. Right. And, and I sort of had this reaction, like, you don't know what you've done. Like this, this isn't for me. I don't, I can't do anything with this. This is for people who have the academics, all these uh, preconceptions, uh, flared yeah. up and I. I just felt like it was stupid, but she insisted I give it a try. And I, I read uh, this book on, on a plane ride and it was like simultaneously um, an epiphany that like, holy shit, I can actually do this. I like this. This is logical. Uh -huh. And at the same time, I was just, I was pissed because I felt like my whole life people had been lying to me saying that I couldn't do this and that I had like disregarded it and I'm starting, I was 21. I could have started 10 years before that. Yeah. I've been wasting my time because I had this right. misconception, right? I think a lot of people labor under that misconception that like that programming is something that you can't easily, like that's something that people do after a university degree or whatever, but that's just really not the case, especially today. Yeah. And, um, yeah, especially and today. I, There's so many resources. Like you talk about getting a book in the nineties and I, I got, uh, I can't remember what my C++ book I got in the 90s, but it was fantastic, but it was just a book. And if you got stuck, well, you read the chapter again. You know what right. I mean? And that was yeah. it, right? It was like really hard. Now there's there's YouTube, there's online courses, video uh -huh. courses, there's communities like Python Discord. The support that is there is much, so all this stuff that you're talking about, it's more true now than ever. Yes, exactly. Um, and I guess I've, you know, in, in my involvement in Python Discord, I'm trying to be part of, um, of letting people understand that that's true, like being that support system to help people get into programming, even though they're young. And uh, 
uh, and inexperienced that it, it is possible. You can come hang out with us. We can help you get into Python, learn how, you know, take your first steps into development. I think that's important uh, to, to be there because, because I, yeah, I'm, I'm a little upset that that wasn't, that I didn't take that path earlier. Yeah. But um, I, I, I yeah. didn't have quite the same experience, but I had a similar experience where I thought, oh, this is interesting. I it would be cool, but it's, I, there's no way I can do that. Yeah. Well, when did you start? I started doing C++ programming in my senior year in college for a research project because mm. I had kind of been good with computers, but I didn't really consider myself a programmer. Um, so I just, you know, I pursued other things like science mm. and whatnot and math, and and I just finally got into it. And I, the thing that really made me realize, like, I'm this is something I really like, is I I remember working on these research projects and it was um, a math research project, but also required a lot of visualization and programming. And I would be really excited when I'm doing the programming part. Then I have to get a, some programming math. Like I have to solve some of the math problems in code. I'm like, oh, this part is kind of boring. Uh, okay, back to the program. You know, like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, oh, wait exactly. a minute. The part that I'm supposed to be here for is the part I like least. So the programming is just super awesome. And I, yeah, mm -hmm. so later as well. Uh, but yeah, it's better late than never, right? Yeah. No, that's, that's sort of my story as well. Like uh, when I picked up, I didn't really like C++. I learned C. I didn't really like that either. I got a little bit into like game um, programming. I looked at C Sharp, later Unity. Um, and and none of it really clicked with me. But when I found Python, it was like, uh, you know, Angel Chorus. Like finally I found my, my home. It was like the wool being lifted off my eyes. Like I found my thing. And yeah. I started putting it in every facet, every corner of my life. Like... I was working in, um, as I was an ops uh, engineer at the time, working for an ISP, and I just started automating all of the boring stuff. Uh, yeah, I was like, yeah. Excel. You get stuff so and, much joy out of that because it's those yeah. things that just grind on you every day, and then you're like, wait a minute, that can happen instantly and automatic. That can go <laughs> yeah. away. And then after doing that for uh, a couple of years, I realized that I was having way more fun than writing the code than I wasn't doing <laughs> anything else in my job. And I needed to just like pivot. Yeah. But it's hard yeah. when you don't have that, any education, no real experience to find that first job. It I, is. I applied like 50 places, I think, before someone really gave me a chance. And, and they only gave me a chance because they were like, yeah, but we'll give you a tough technical interview. It'll be like several stages. You'll yeah. have to write a whole project and send it in to us this will take a week like to finish, but I got through it and they were impressed and they gave me a chance. And once you get that first job, at least here in Norway, uh, where I'm situated, they basically throw jobs at you if you have a couple yeah. of years experience. I think that's pretty true in general. I think it's true in the US as well, where that first step is such a big one. But if you mm -hmm. can get into the industry, then like, oh, you're you know what you're doing, then there's all these opportunities open up. So I think mm -hmm. anyone who's out there is listening who feels frustrated, like, oh, it's so hard to get that first job. Like that is the hardest career step you're ever going to make, right? Because yeah. after that, it's just, it's so much smoother and, and easier. Yeah, I think especially for people who are in other jobs and they're looking to like change into development, it's tough. But once, once you have that foot in the door, oh, it's, it's amazing. Like I could pretty much change jobs uh, today if I wanted to, to any number yeah. of other things. Yeah, absolutely. But I, but I won't because I love my job. <laughs> yeah, so what the other question I always got to ask at the beginning of the show is because it's really interesting to hear the perspective that people are coming from. Yeah. You know, are you a DevOps person? Are you a scientist? Are you a web developer? So you know, what, what do you do these days? So I'm working for a company called Dignio, and we're a med tech company um, focused on uh, remote care is the technical term for it. So essentially we're, um, so, okay. The pitch is, did you know that hospitals and governments in general spend like a significant amount of their budget, uh, dealing with chronically ill patients who make up a, a, a minority of the actual patients who are being treated. So we're spending like yeah. most of our money on the fewest of the people. It's like the last one year of life is so expensive compared to the, the prior, you know, N minus one. Yeah, and then you have this shift going on in certain countries where, like, um, the uh, age groups are shifting, so there are more older people, and you need way more elder care. 
and it's expensive because uh, the elderly often have chronic diseases. And again, that takes up an enormous mm -hmm. amount of resources. So the main thing is they keep having to go to doctors. They have to have to go to hospitals to get like simple checkups and measurements. And so our solution is, well, they should do that from home. They shouldn't have to constantly be traveling around to, to places to, to like get their blood pressure measured or whatever. We can do that via Bluetooth and an app. Yeah. And then you can yeah. just deliver all of the metrics to the doctor and they can contact them if, if something changes, if, if it looks bad, right? Like so that they get the treatment when they need it, but they don't have to constantly be um, wasting their own time and uh, the, the, well, the government's resources essentially on uh, uh, taking the bus for four hours to get to the nearest whatever. It's stupid. So we're trying to solve Yeah, that's that. fantastic. And right now we're part of the COVID-19 thing. I mean, uh, remote care plays a big role there. We want to keep people out of hospitals, obviously, and, and prevent um, infection from spreading. So uh, having them uh, be, you know, they're doing their measurements at home, they're reporting their symptoms and uh, taking their own temperature measurements and stuff like that. And then the, the COVID-19 teams can just monitor them remotely. So we're working with the NHS in the UK, we're working here in Norway with um, the capital and uh, with a bunch of hospitals and we're trying to get deeper into China. It's really exciting work. And I think that, you know, like ultimately it's, it's important work. It makes me sleep well at night. Yeah. Yeah. But, you're uh, you're legitimately point, helping people, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think ultimately we're going to save lives. Like at some point you inevitably save a life because you're helping relieve pressure from these like import these critical systems. Um, and, um, as, yeah. maybe that's especially true during a pandemic, you have to like keep the capacity open at, at hospitals and so on. Like, uh, so I often think do. about what changes are going to stick after the pandemic is mm -hmm. over or reduced and what's just going to go back to normal. Right. And one of the, I, I think that that kind of remote care stuff is going to stick. I think it's going to be one of the things like, why didn't we just do this before? Right? You really don't need to come in to say, are you still feeling fine? Yeah, I'm feeling fine. Here's my measurements that my wearable has been collecting. Yeah, it yes. looks like you're fine, right? And, and we've been around for 10 years. I, remote care has been around since the early 2010s. But it's like, as soon as the pandemic hit, it exploded. You've seen companies like well, Zoom and all of these people who specialize in uh, having your doctor uh, check up uh, re remotely. They're exploding. They're they're being propelled five, ten years into the future in terms of like growth and opportunity. Um, and yeah, that's not going to go away after the pandemic calms down. We're here to stay now. And I, I know firsthand that municipalities and governments are buying in, like uh, not just like temporary relief for COVID-19, but more permanent solutions for, for remote care and monitoring. So this yeah. is definitely one of the changes we're going to see, I think, uh, cool. stick around. Yeah. And Python's powering some of that? Python's powering most of that. Our whole backend is Python, Flask. Um, our infrastructure as code is mostly in Python uh, and also a, a lot of Terraform. Mm -hmm. I have been involved across the whole stack. We also use Angular for our front end. We have Swift and Android and Kotlin. Um, so there's a big stack, but Python is at its heart running yeah. the backend that talks to all of the different uh, platforms um, that uh, that their services use. Cool. So Yeah, uh, yeah. very neat. To, yeah. It sounds like a fun place to work. I was just going to say, before we move on to the main topic, though, there is one other thing that I think you are uh, quite notable for in the recent days. <laughs> yeah, I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you did this beautiful <laughs> song <laughs> called the Pep 8 song. And look at that. It's almost got 30,000 views on YouTube, which is uh, pretty amazing. I'll put the link into the live stream for people to check out. But yeah, what was the inspiration behind that? That was really well received. That yeah, was a so team effort, right? That was a team, team effort. Uh, one of my admins, uh, Daniel Brown, came to me with an idea. He said, uh, you know, wouldn't it be funny if uh, we did a, a version of Mad World, but instead of saying Mad World, you sing Pep 8, and the whole song is just about... <laughs> so he just gave me the idea, that, and it was beautiful. I was like, yes, we need to do it immediately. Yeah. I just got started. Yeah. I got some people involved in helping out uh, f finish everything up. Um, and my, my sweetheart filmed it. Um, so it was, um, it was great. Uh, and I worked with, we have an outreach team at Python Discord uh, with uh, Sebastian Seff uh, 
in the lead and he helped sort of like get it out there. And I think we really managed to somehow get it out there. I mean, this could have been a thing that nobody ever saw. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's probably a lot of great stuff that got through. created and posted and like went nowhere. Right. Yeah, for sure. No, this was fun. Uh, I mean, it's, I can't really take much credit because it's just a cover of uh, an existing song, but I've been making music since, since I was a teenager. You know, like I said, I tried to be a musician. So I, I cherish every occasion I get to actually sit down and make something fun. And like, especially when you can share it with a community and the, they like it. Um, so I most of the music I write, nobody will ever hear. Yeah. Uh, or at least very few people. So this is just, uh, yeah, it's been really fun. Yeah. Well, if you haven't heard the song, I'll put the link in the show notes. People should definitely check it out because it's, it's all about the, you know, don't use try except pass. Here's what you do with comments, all the stuff that you learn about in Pep8 to write good Python code, but musical form. Isn't it bizarre how much music like connects with your memory? Mm -hmm. You know, right. like like I, my daughters, when they were younger, they would sing songs. They would know every word. Uh, there was this biology teacher who wrapped the um, the energy cycle of the cell, like mitochondria and all that. And like she would study for biology by just listening to the rap about mitochondria. And you've got Hamilton, the, the musical, which so many people listen to and learned about like detailed American history, which they would think was so boring. But then it's in music form. So they now love it. Right. That's weird. Right. The, the 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 Animaniac song with all the states and the yeah. periodic table thing that yep. was uh, right. All of these are examples of yeah. It's a it's a vehicle for learning. It, I think it actually works. I love the Pepe. It's really dear to my heart. <laughs> um, it's one yeah. of these documents. I think that like it so perfectly explains sort of the culture of Python, um, and it's well written. It's easy to read. You should all read it too. Not just like listen to the song. You should go read the Pepe. Yeah. If you haven't read it, it's very very edible. Yeah. It's like the operating instructions for Python code. Yeah. Here's, what, here, here's how you should get started for sure. Yeah. But the main thing that uh, we're here to talk about today is Python Discord. What's, That's right. So Discord is uh, something kind of like Slack, but more focused on the gaming community traditionally. Want to just tell people what Discord is real quick and then... Python yeah, so they Discord? started out as sort of a competitor for stuff like TeamSpeak and... Um, yep. and they wanted to be that gaming platform, but then they've sort of pivoted because they've attracted communities that are way outside of that uh, core market. And now recently they've rebranded to being just like a place for people to have good conversations, like that local community feel like you have a sewing club or your local swim team, uh, get a discord. And, and yeah. it really is a solid platform. They have very high quality video conversations and every feature that Slack has and then some. Um, yeah, what I really like is you can just go in there and you could be chatting in a room or you could just say, click a button and like, let's make this a video call. And mm -hmm. then it is, right? Uh, it's, right? It's really easy to sort of jump through the different mediums of communication there. But I think the thing that they nail that Slack isn't, I mean, Slack is really intended for these like small corporate teams so that you can have the, your own space. Whereas Discord uh, is more for like open communities, right? So they want more people to join in. So it's it's got this discoverability aspect. You can grow your community as big as you want. On Slack, the, technically, after you have a certain amount of messages, they tell you, well, now you have to like uh, pay uh, to uh, to unlock the content in this channel. And that's not suitable if you have 100,000 people in the community and they're charging eight bucks a head. <laughs> like it doesn't work. So, so Slack's great for your work chat, but it's not really suitable for a massive community uh, like like Python Discord. Uh, so it's a really, really great place for that. A lot of tech platforms have, have uh, moved to, to Discord as well. Interesting. We have the Reactiflux people. That's a massive server. Uh, Palettes projects, uh, the people who made the Flask and mm -hmm. uh, Click, they're on Discord as well. Many of the game frameworks like uh, Piglet and... Uh, Pi game was there up until recently. I think they may have disbanded that server, but, but yeah, there's a lot of tech there happening. Yeah, Great another thing that you talked about that's really interesting here is there's a whole way to program it with Python that allows you to sort of make it better, like bots and other things, right? That's right. It's quite accessible to Python um, through this framework called uh, discord.py. Um, so uh, it's made by this guy called Danny and um, it's uh, it's fairly easy to work with. It's fully 
asynchronous. So in that sense, it's a little high level. You have to understand the async uh, await uh, syntax. Not everyone learns that uh, first day of Python, but um, once you get there, it's uh, it's very nice. It uses a lot of um, it uses type annotations in a clever way to uh, convert the input that you send to the bot to something useful, like a user or a, a channel. It uses uh, lots of decorators. So it's actually quite a beautiful uh, solution to that problem. And you can, you can make very, very scalable bots that can be on thousands of communities at the same time, interacting with like millions of users without it uh, falling apart. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Joe Banks out there in the live stream says uh, at Python uh, Discord, we'd hit the Slack limit of around a thousand, uh, sorry, ten thousand messages in uh, less than ten hours. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not a great long-term solution, is it? No, it wouldn't work for us. Joe Banks, of course, being uh, one of the co-owners of Python Discord, yeah, along fantastic. with Sebastian Seff. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So how'd this get started? Tell us about the community. Yeah, so. Uh, about four years ago, I met Joe uh, in this community. At that time, it had 200 users. And um, it was a very different place. It wasn't like we didn't, nobody there really took it seriously. It was just a small server of people who were into Python. But then I guess um, there were a couple of us who started really seeing the potential that this had to be a, a great place uh, to learn and to teach. And I've always believed that teaching is a, it's a fantastic way for me to cement my skills, to improve my, my own skills. So I've always like tried to spend a lot of time teaching and tutoring because I thought it made me a better programmer as well. And you know, like it's yeah, a nice I, wholesome I, thing. I to totally do. agree. I think it does. And I'm kind of sold that to a lot of more experienced users. Like you should spend your time here because it's gonna make you a better developer and because it's a nice thing to do. And we started getting more and more of those people who were into that culture. I think at that time, I felt like I wanted to create something that was um, in opposition to my experience in the 90s. I spent a lot of time on IRC, and IRC was not a nice place. It was very toxic. <laughs> yeah. uh, generally, if you asked a question, you were told it was a stupid question, and you shouldn't have asked it. And you were just sort of expected to know everything. And I think that people, you know, young people coming into that, meeting that kind of uh, toxicity on their first day, they could be discouraged from ever trying it seriously. So um, uh, I think it's important to have a community where you're welcome with open arms, where like we encourage stupid questions and hold your hand through them, right? Yeah, and that's one of the things you said you're really trying to curate there at Python Discord is having a, a welcoming place for beginners, right? Yes, we've uh, curated that with, uh, I should say, extreme prejudice. <laughs> so like we've been extremely harsh in getting rid of any kind of toxic element and yeah. just like rooting out anything that didn't fit into our idea of the culture. So the culture is wholesomeness, like full blast wholesomeness. And we just want to be the nicest little community on, on the internet where, uh, where nobody's allowed to say anything uh, mean or disrespectful because that's yeah. just, it doesn't have any place in like your first impressions of learning to code. I think that should be a nice and warm experience. It's harder now that we're so big, but like back then it was easy. I could read yeah. every single message that was posted into the community. I could personally moderate everything that happened. And I did yeah. for a long while. Um, but then as we grew bigger, we had to sort of build a, a, a set of uh, staff members who agreed with, with our cultural values, our core values. And so, and we started really growing because we were it was important just to reach out to more people, I guess, and we, we really believed in what we were doing. So we were doing creative stuff like we um, uh, s uh, we looked for partnerships with other types of communities. We um, we even found a different Python community that were roughly the same size as us. And then I uh, had a meeting with them and convinced them to merge with us, which isn't really a feature in Discord. So what we actually did was we just mothballed the other community, removed every channel, left a link to ours, tried to like funnel all of their users all into right, our right. community. If you come here and you find it empty, and this is where yeah. everyone's gone. Yeah. And then we, we took we, their we... staff members and invited them into our staff. Uh, some of them are still there. Some of them are fantastic. Actually, the one of the owners, uh, Sebastian, came from there. Um, and um, and then, yeah, so so we've done that. We've, we've looked for, um, we, we partnered with uh, the subreddit, rpython, quite early. 
got in touch with Andrew Phoenix over there who, who runs the show and uh, got involved there. And I think we got a lot of traffic via Reddit. Um, we had some yeah. pretty good SEO search engine. Reddit's really interesting, right? There's a lot of uh, cool stuff happening with Python on Reddit, but also Reddit can be a little bit harsh. Like the people there are, can be a little bit rough. Uh, yeah, for various reasons. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. You got to be careful, right? You do. Um, yeah, and but but I think the thing that happens though when we were um, when people found us through really through just googling us, but they would Google not specifically for us. They would Google Python Discord, thinking, "Hey, what's you know like is there a Discord for Python?" But we decided. Hey, you know, what would be good is if we just double down on that and use that as our name, get the domain yeah. pythondiscord.com, put it everywhere. Like if we are Python Discord, then that's the thing people Google, they're going to find us. Yeah. And um, that really worked, I think, it was a, a sort of a creative way to uh, get our names out there. So, yeah, we started really attracting people and then uh, we just kept uh, partnering up with uh, people. We got listed on python.org slash community. Nice. Um, We've, uh, yeah, there's yeah. there's a couple of people out in the live stream uh, comments on the community thing. So Robert Robinson says the community is the best thing for beginners to advanced developers. Three yeah. OS says there's no room for toxicity. I, I think that really okay. is great. Um, Robert also not as harsh as Stack Overflow, which is interesting. <laughs> but you know, how much do you think that the culture of Python itself matched with the programmer community that you guys are running? Say, like, if it was a Java or C++, do you think they have slightly different backgrounds, right? Like, yeah, so, do you so think I it think makes a difference? It does, because these are the people that we attract, right? Like, the staff members, they come from from a place of, of understanding that Python has this kind of culture. And I think that we would have attracted a different set of staff members if, uh, if Python didn't have such an inclusive culture. Mm. So... Uh, by Python establishing, and they've done that all on their own. They've been amazing at building a really strong culture for Python, I think. And inclusivity has been like a really strong uh, a fighting point for them, I think. So that means that when we find these advanced Python users who are already renowned in their own way, they, they're, you know, like full-time Python developers, they're speakers at conferences, they're library uh, maintainers. They're really nice people, generally. Like most of the people I meet in this community, they're already on board with what we're trying to do. So there's this uh, synergy between uh, the Python culture and our culture that's really played in our favor, I think. Yeah, I, I would think so as well. I mean, there's the Brett Cannon quote, like I came for the language, stayed for the community type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Uh, what have you done to try to keep that Zen of that community as you've grown to over 100,000 participants? So the main thing that because now that we're getting so big, we have a big staff and running a big staff of 100 people is work. We had to start treating it almost like a startup. So being a staff member at Python Discord is, is, a, is a job, like it's real work. We have meetings, we have several meetings a week. <laughs> we have meetings with the admins, yep. with the leads. We have an all hands meeting. We have project meetings for certain projects that we're pursuing. We have a roadmap that we follow very carefully and plan out with the admins. Many of the admins have a domain that they look after. So like this guy is responsible for moderation and, um, and one person on maybe events. Uh, and that means that um, there's a bit of ownership. And through the entire staff, we've been like really actively perpetuating this focus on culture, right? And they all really agree with it anyway. So it's, it's not like a hard sell, but by, by motivating our staff to follow that sort of ethos, uh, it, it bleeds out to the rest of the community naturally and everything that we do there. Like I can't personally follow up all the stuff that we do, but, uh, but it, it naturally happens through, I guess, a form of leadership. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, three, three OS says I joined Python discord for a question. I'm still here for almost a year later. Don't regret a single day. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's really nice to hear stuff like this. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, it sounds like a super cool community. People can go in there and talk about different topics. I imagine, right? Like if you want to talk about Flask. There's a flax Flask section you want to talk about getting started. There's probably something for that. Yeah. So we've organized it so that Mm, there's a topical channel for for a bunch of different topics that are basically like domains. So we have like an async channel, we have web development where you can ask, uh, 
Sure, Flask. Even if you have a JavaScript uh, question, you could, you're welcome to ask it there. We've got you know a place for game development uh, frameworks, uh, that kind of stuff. And there, there's also some general channels where you can talk about just about anything. And then beyond that, for people who just are looking for help, we built a system on top of Discord that's kind of unique um, to deliver uh, help channels, almost like a ticketing system. So you come in and you claim a channel of your own, a help channel. And then in that channel, you can ask anything you want. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and then you will be assigned sort of as the owner of that channel and people will come and help you. Yeah, and you said that with this many people, you have to do like a, sort of a load balancing type thing mm -hmm. to make sure yeah. that people can have some help, but that doesn't get overwhelmed and, and sort of partition it. You want to talk about that a little bit? It's been challenging. We used to have just like, oh, there generic help that was a channel. <laughs> now and it's just streaming by, like suddenly killing was, the log. Yeah. Suddenly it was like three channels because there were so many people at the same time, and you couldn't, nobody could ask anything. And then it grew to, I think, eight at its most. And, and we were just like, we can't keep scaling like this. We, we need to figure out a better solution. So we came up with this rotating uh, channel claiming system. It's all run on the thing I mentioned earlier, discord.py. We wrote all the code for this. Uh, members of the community volunteered, you know, like there are tens of thousands of lines of code in our bot uh, that's directly responsible for running the community, running all these systems on top of uh, the vanilla setup that, that Discord gives us. Uh, it, it's a really powerful thing, you know, when you run a community full of programmers that uniquely you can then put them to work doing all this stuff that other types of communities would never be able to do because they just yeah, don't have that yeah, amount yeah. of, right? So many creative and wonderful people are willing to invest their free time to, to make something awesome for that. I really, I'm lucky to be surrounded by so many uh, active contributors I mean, we've had dozens I, I, of people help build this. Yeah, I do think that having this programming skill, it's it's almost like being a magician, right? Mm -hmm. You can think of this idea and you're like, you know, I can make that happen. Yeah. I just, I got to think about it a little bit more and then it'll exist. And there's not many other things like that. No, right. so, yeah, much, right. so much of the creative stuff, actually, you've got to, eventually the rubber meets the road. You've got to create a thing, right? Like if you're a chemist or you're an engineer, like you can create, you can imagine things, but eventually they got to get built. But for programmers, it's just sort of more thinking until it exists. And it's it's really cool to see like communities putting that to you. So like, oh, I have this idea. What if the bot could do this? Well, you know, you, here's the source code. Make right. it do that. I, yeah, it's like a superpower. I think one person mm -hmm. who knows how to code in a community, it can be like a wizard who, who makes stuff happen. And I have a hundred wizards. So <laughs> yeah. like I can do whatever I want pretty much. It's amazing. <laughs> It really makes the difference, I think, that makes, that's that little extra cherry on top that makes this community really shine. Yeah, well, and the fact that Discord has an API and doesn't try to like lock it off and make it impossible to sort of do mm. extra stuff, right? Right. I mean, it's not by any means trivial, but uh, um, there are good packages out there that abstract all the pain away, or most of the pain anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, super cool. So one of the things that you all have been doing is... Um, you've been running different kinds of events. Do you yes. want to tell us about some of the events and things you got, you've got you done and maybe we'll Absolutely. do in the future? So I think a lot of people come to us with a question or to find some help or some guidance, but then we want them to stay. And one of the ways that we try to do that is to always have something going on. Uh, and the events is our way of like having an activity always happening in the community. Um, so we started with, um, we created a second bot that was just for fun. And then we had like monthly events like a Valentine's event or Halloween event where we would invite people to solve these simple problems. Uh, so for the Halloween event, we would say, okay, I want you to write a spooky movie recommender. It's just <laughs> right. a function, right? And so we provide the bot and the infrastructure for the bot to run on. You just write uh, a command for the bot. It's really just a function that returns a spooky movie, right? That's fairly easy for people to do. And so we get people um, uh, willing to, to take on that task. And then we filled up this bot with all of these things. So every month we would have a theme and then we would get more people involved in that. But here's the tricky part is we would force them to commit it to GitHub. It would go through reviews. Mm -hmm. and we were kind of harsh reviewers sometimes. We will give a proper review, uh, but we, we do it in a very educational way, I think, where we explain very clearly why something needs to change, if it needs to change. 
we have uh, continuous integration systems and continuous deployment set up on all of these things so that you know the code has to lint properly has to get through it has to match the pep8 basically uh, and uh, run tests and and all this stuff so it sounds easy when you start off yeah you're just writing a, a simple function to return a spooky movie but then actually we're stealth educating these people on how to work on like an open source framework right like right you're teaching them all the the uh, engineering workflow stuff of uh -huh. linting ci yeah github Precisely. all that kind of stuff and yeah. i think that that stuff is amazing to know if you want to go out there and work in the field you have to know these things but uh, there aren't that many places online that will try to teach you those places yeah well it's also all the difference between is this a real programmer or someone who just has like learned a little bit about the language, right? Like I, whenever I was doing interviews, you could always sort of tell, is this person really in the community? Do they, do they kind of know the moving <laughs> yeah. part? You know what I mean? Like, cause I would interview people and they would sometimes just make up stuff that they know. I'm like, you don't actually know this, do you? I, I could tell that this is not a thing. <laughs> right. And I think having those skills it depends how you get into programming, but a lot of people who come into Python. They don't come through the, I want to, Carnegie Mellon for four years. They come mm -hmm. through the, I got inspired, I got a book or I got some kind of thing where I, I started learning programming and I've been mostly on my own, but I'm trying to get into the the world of programming and yeah. you know, no one tells you you need to learn about continuous integration. Uh, right, exactly. People, right? Or unit testing frameworks or uh, or what have you. And I um, actually, we do the same thing when we interview for for my job. We, we, we often focus on the soft skills. We mm. try to like, you know, if we can determine whether someone writes a good commit message, that tells you a lot about them. Yeah. Even though it's not strictly, you know, the thing that we're actually looking for. We're looking for like talented programmers, but the two things are uh, slightly linked in a way. Often yeah. one indicates the other. But yeah, so that was our first sort of, uh, our first uh, step into events. And then it grew from there. I had this idea. I started a, a code jam and I wanted it to be a unique thing because again, we're a lot of people do code jams and they're mostly like game jams. Yeah, give us a quick, what's the elevator pitch? What's a code jam? So a, a Python Discord code jam or just a code jam in general? Uh, in general. In general, it's you have a week, you have to solve a problem. Uh, you don't necessarily know what the problem is before you start solving it. Uh, and um, uh, maybe you have to solve it within a specific context. So like a framework or a language, something like that. And like then use React to build a game. A 2D yeah. scroller game in a week, something like that, uh -huh. maybe. Except okay. something like that. And so we wanted to do a spin on this uh, mm -hmm. to activate our users to do something fun for a week. But again, I'm trying to like uh, do something that nobody else is doing. So my spin was you have to do it with a team of strangers, not on your own, not with some people you know. You have to get out of that um, safety net, out of your comfort zone and solve a problem in a setting that you might see in an open source project or in, in a job. Right? Yeah, because one of the challenges can be there might be these people who've done these before, right? Like these groups of people, we all go to college together, we were roommates. Now we just go do these these events because they're fun and we still do them together. But if there's like a tight knit group of four people that say, okay, you do the database, I'll do the UI, you do the back end, go, right? That That's not the same thing as, <laughs> you know, a couple of people, I, well, I want to be part of it too. Like we'll find some random folks to meet up, right? So you're kind of trying to equalize that a little. Yeah, they would come in and annihilate everyone. And um, I want people to be uncomfortable. I want them to do something hard and to come out of it having learned how to overcome those challenges, right? Yeah. So, um, so that's the pitch is, is that we, we team you up with some people you've never met. We give you a framework. Let's say you have to write a Django app. And then on the day you start, we tell you, oh, and by the way, it has to be thematic of uh, climate change. Or uh, we had one where, where we said that the, the, the theme was this app hates you. <laughs> and so we asked people to make apps that hate I think users. I've used some of those. Super fun. Um, yeah. My favorite, I remember there was this one team, they made uh, like a paint clone similar to MS Paint, but all of the different tools were terrible in their own way. <laughs> so like you would use the paintbrush, but it would like drip paint on top of the canvas. How beautiful. And uh, the, the pencil, would the tip would break and it would like fall. <laughs> You'd have to constantly be like, a what? Yeah. So each uh, each tool uniquely terrible, really fun. Now recently we had one where the theme was early internet, 
and we had a team that created sort of a, a Windows uh, 98 uh, or Windows 95 clone uh, in Django. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. And it looked fairly, you know, nostalgic. But this, but then the, the actual thing inside of that Windows clone was that there was a working browser. And when you use the browser, um, they would intercept the HTML and like modify it to look like early internet. They would pixelate the images or, you know, like add filters and stuff to make it look old and kind of broken. It was really, really genuinely interesting. And you could go to any page on the web. Um, wow. So people do these amazing things within the limitations we set for them. It's really inspiring to watch some of the, the stuff. We actually, we make some videos on our YouTube. There are uh, highlights videos. Uh, yeah, here's uh, that, that, that's nostalgic. <laughs> there are highlight videos on our YouTube that show off some of the projects that people come up with. We're going to release another one within a month or two uh, for the one, uh, the, the code gem that was last summer. So, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, we should link to those. Yeah, I think back to the early internet. Gosh, if yeah. you had modern tools and the modern tool chain, you could just blow people's minds. I mean, it was so <laughs> bad. It was yeah. so incredibly bad, right? Just, yes. Ah, oh, just... yeah. The Amazon ones are the absolute worst. You should, you, you should all go and like look up what Amazon looked like in its first iteration. Hilariously bad. Yeah, it's, oh my gosh. Yeah, so th these are some of the types of things you do, right? Uh, the, these events. Do you have any coming up? Um, we have, um, oh, that's another one we've been in. We've invited Pi Week, which is actually a 15-year-old uh, Python event, one of the oldest, probably the longest running game jam in the entire ecosystem. Um, we basically offered to, um, to to take it into our fold and help them advertise it, market it, and uh, to put it together because um, they were stretched a little thin, maybe. Um, and Daniel Pope, uh, who runs it uh, currently, uh, Maeve, Lord Maeve, uh, mm -hmm. he's, uh, uh, he's, he's just become a father, I think, and he's quite busy with things. And, um, <laughs> that changes your perspective on free time. Yeah or changes your free time. <laughs> He's a wonderful guy. I really enjoyed working with him on, on the previous Pi Week we ran uh, last autumn, and now we're, we're probably going to help him put one together. He's still running the show, but we help out in every way we can. So there's a Pi Week coming up um, uh, sometime this spring. I don't know if a date has been announced yet. Then we have a Code Jam this summer. Um, and um, uh, in October, we run the Hacktoberfest events. Uh, December, we run Advent of Code together with the Advent of Code staff. There's basically something happening every couple months. Uh, what do people do to participate? How do they participate? Um, well, it, it, if you're a member of the community, um, if you type exclamation mark subscribe in the bot commands channel, uh, you will be subscribed to uh, announcements. We will basically will ping you. Uh, every time something big is happening. So, so we will always let you know. There's also an event page uh, on our website. You can usually see upcoming, major upcoming events on the front page. There's an event sub page there that has everything listed. So it's, it's fairly hard to miss if you're a member of the community. Um, but, um, but yeah, the subscribe uh, command for our bot, that will make sure that you will definitely be let know. Yeah. So that's uh, how we keep people informed. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Sounds like a lot of fun for people to participate in these things. Another thing that you did recently that was noteworthy is you all hosted the um, core developer sprints. Yeah, that was yeah. interesting. We, I mean, we obviously, we love the PSF, the Python Software Foundation, and we have a core developer on the staff as well. Um, um, Kyle Stanley, he's um, a core developer, works on async IO. Uh, he's great. He, he's one of our moderators. And um, so he got in touch with me and told me that, well, because PyCon was canceled and usually they have this core dev sprint at PyCon, they yeah. sit together for a week and they just work on like CPython stuff together. Um, but, I think uh, a lot of people don't realize that when PyCon fell victim to the pandemic, like everything has, th there's so much of that that happens. You know, in open source, it 
you could work for years and never actually face to face have a conversation with someone you're working with, right? So a lot yeah. of those those sprints, both for core developers in Python, but also for like Flask and Django and other groups would have these get togethers where people could come and contribute. And yeah, that kind yeah. of fell by the wayside, right? Yeah, I think that was a, a big, um, a lot of people took it quite poorly. I mean, that's like the highlight of their year. Many of them, uh, if you're a core developer, the, the PSF will pay your ticket to come and, and hang out with them and do the course sprint. And yeah. it's like this big event. Uh, I would love to do that myself. Sit down I, yeah, with some I, of these like, smartest people. I, I know it'd be amazing. I always consider PyCon my geek holiday. It's like my chance to get away and just enjoy time. Yeah with uh my friends who i only see at conferences go to go out and have dinner and beer with them afterwards and yeah i've never been because you know well, i had to cross the atlantic to get there so uh, but hopefully one day yeah. so someday soon hopefully right so they canceled that and so they were looking for an alternative way because they needed to do the core dev sprint but obviously they had to do it remotely so they were looking into how they would uh host that and i just suggested to kyle that uh if you guys are interested, EuroPython did it on Discord uh, recently, and uh, we could host you. We could set up everything you need, all the channels, take care of like moderation. Uh, if you want to reach out to the community or something, we could put together a call or something like that. And they were interested, and eventually they voted in favor of doing that. So we had all the core developers, 40 of them at least, uh, hanging out with us. Uh, and uh, we, we left them. I mean, they had their own sort of gated off area of the community where they did this. And we've done that for some of the other events like FOSDEM mostly recently. We hosted their organizers and their talk, uh, their speakers, uh, so that we, they have an area to be in without having to go through the hassle of like setting up their own community and managing and administrating all of that because it is work. Yeah. And, uh, so what's that look like in, in practice? They have their own channel. Yeah. Then, um, they do like screen share for the presentations. Yeah, we just set it up so that all they got to do is just join. And then right at the top of the channel list is just all the stuff that's relevant to them. Nobody else can see it. Um, just, you know, the organizers and the members of, of that event. So for them, it almost looks like we've just set up a whole server just for them. And then at the bottom, if they want to, they can go and explore our public channels and talk to the community. And some of them did. And there was a lot of really good interaction with uh, with the other members of the community. Yeah. Um, but um, but if they want to, and if they want pr uh, privacy, which many of them did, they can just stay in, in their own like gated off area. So that's been a one, one way that we've been, been able to sort of give back to the ecosystem a little bit and help out. Um, and of course, uh, they also chose to have a Q and A that um, they collected uh, questions from the community and they wanted to do a stream and we put together the stream on YouTube for them. Uh, it's available both on the PSF's uh, own YouTube and on ours, uh, a full length hour long, I think, uh, uh, core developer Q and A from questions from the community. Really, really interesting. I highly recommend it. Yeah. And, nice. Uh, That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It was really fun. We're, uh, we really love the PSF. We work with them on other stuff like they, they are looking for, uh, you know, help uh, get their announcements out there. We have quite a bit of reach by now, um, in part due to, like our announcement channel, sure, it reaches our 150,000 members, but there's also a feature where you can subscribe to, you can put our announcements into your community. Um, and there's 2,000 communities right now that sort of relay all of the announcements we make. So then that wow. reaches an additional, I don't even know how many people. And then we've got Twitter and we've got does that, that so. does that push notifications out to other discord communities or yeah. uh, some other types of communities? Is it, it uh, like oh, discord? Oh, right. discord? No, it's, it's only discord. Yeah. So there's 2000 yeah. discord communities. Probably most of them are, are small, you know, 10 people who are friends or whatever kind of communities, but there are some that are, are rather big. Yeah. 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 Very so, cool. So. Yeah. It seems like the community, like the core devs and the advanced channel. Uh, yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. Awesome. Quite cool. Um, so I guess one other thing that we could talk about that you guys are doing is you have some open source stuff, like your bot, for example, is open source and so on. You want to talk a little bit about some of the code? Yeah, I mean, we have um, a lot of open source repositories and we try. So this is about um, 
Python Discord has to be a great place for beginners to discover programming and to get help and so on, but it also needs to be a place that's engaging for more advanced users. And one of the ways that we're doing that is to try to provide um, a learning opportunities, even for people who have years of experience with Python. And, and one of the ways that you can improve your hone your skills and, and get better is to work on exciting projects that help the community. Yeah. So we've open sourced everything. We're very transparent about how everything works. And there's a whole bunch of projects from um, the bots. There are three, four bots by now, I think. No, three. Um, we've got um, the website, of course, and uh, some microservices that interact with the website. Um, Snackbox is an interesting one. That's a completely sandboxed Python evaluation uh, tool. That's right, yeah. So that we can have uh, a command on the server where people can run actual raw Python code without them being able to like destroy all our servers, <laughs> because there's of course a risk associated with people. Yeah, that's the danger of it. Hey, code. you want, you want to test this code out? Click here. Oh wait, the code I'm trying to test is you know sub process launch such and such. Yeah, <laughs> or whatever. No, yeah. So we have like several layers of sandboxing. Uh, like if it takes too long or if it uses specific uh, parts of the standard library that might be used in a malicious way, then it just doesn't do it at all. But even if it does do it, it's inside of uh, one sandbox that's inside another sandbox. And it's very, very safe. And, and this is open source. You can take this tool, Snackbox, and you can use it in your bot or in your website or whatever service you want if you want to be able to like safely evaluate uh, Python code. Nice. So, so what are some examples like how this gets used in, in Discord? Uh, the snack box, we actually yeah. only use it for the bot so that people can evaluate code. But that function is very valuable because yeah. in help sessions, sometimes our um, helpers or people who are trying to explain something, they want to execute some code and show what the result is to sort of explain a concept. So someone's stuck on right, like, how right. does this work? Well, then they can just show them with a code example and it evaluates it right there. And it's a very nice teaching aid, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite cool. Yeah. Nice. Uh, uh, any other projects you want to highlight? Um, yeah, for sure. We've, um, um, we, we try to do projects that aren't strictly just code as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in, in our staff, we have some people who are involved in the DevOps side of Python Discord. We have a very modern uh, DevOps architecture using uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, everything is uh, set up um, with, you know, like everything's its own containerized service. And uh, some of us are, are like really learning how to do advanced, I think, industry standard uh, uh, DevOps uh, by, by doing it here at Python Discord. We yeah. have media projects and branding projects. So people who have graphic design skills, they come in and help us. They oh, that's like clever. say, say we have a Halloween event. Oh, you can come in and make like a spooky banner or something that we might put somewhere, right? And uh, try to get people involved like that. Now we're making a lot of YouTube content, like the Pep 8 song. That means we need editors. We need people who are good at animation, maybe uh, people who can do sound music, all of these kinds of skill sets, we, we try to provide an avenue for them. Uh, to involve themselves and and if you've got a unique skill set that i didn't mention or I, I couldn't even think of then you know if you come and advertise to us maybe we'll be able to find some creative way where we can put that to use yeah oh that's a really interesting way to leverage the community on uh, not just the core programming skills but the other stuff as well yeah and i think it's really essential that we have this kind of approach because i think the thing that's difficult about running a uh, com community of volunteers is that if you run a business, well, I can like buy productivity. I, I pay you, you make me something, right? But right. when I have a community of volunteers, I can't pay, pay you. I don't have any money to pay you with. So the only way I can get you to do something is to motivate you. And there's mm, exactly. some intrinsic motivation in being part of something good and wholesome like this. I think the culture helps bring people in and in, in like from from an altruistic point of view, like they just want to help out. They want to be a good force in the, in the universe. But ultimately, if you really want strong, uh, directed initiative and uh, motivation, I think you have to find like uh, a, a synergy 
a sort of a thing where your personal goals align with the goals of the community, right? Right. So you want to do something for us that's good for you, but it's also good for us. That's the perfect way to motivate people. So by providing as many ways as possible for people to get involved like that, it means that people can come in and actually like build their skill set. Maybe they make something impressive and they can put it on their resume. They can go out and get a job. And we're very good at like trying to um, give people credit and help people out. I've personally been like a job reference for many of the staff members. I've oh, written cool. letters of recommendation, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Uh, cause we really want people to come in and, and if they invest themselves into our community and invest hours of work, I want them to get something out of it, like personally, because that's the best way that I can motivate them to keep working. Yeah. Does it cost money? Uh, is it expensive to run the community like um, servers and bandwidth and all that? We've been lucky enough to be sponsored by um, everyone we needed to be sponsored by. So we have Linode as a sponsor. Um, we've got uh, Notion uh, providing uh, free documentation stuff for us. Um, so uh, with a bunch of different partners we've worked with um, and, and sponsors for, for prizes for uh, the events like Adafruit, we've worked with DigitalOcean, JetBrains has been giving us licenses we can give away for a long time. Sentry is another sponsor that yeah. give us Sentry monitoring. Um, so that covers our like um, our, our essentials, and we don't pay for hosting because Linode is providing all the hosting for free. But we do have some expenses associated with the events, um, T-shirts that's sent out as prices, this sort of thing, and that uh, some of that comes in via our Patreon. Um, for we made a, a really. I'm really happy with this animated explainer video that we send to everyone who joins the community called Welcome to Python Discord. Yeah. In that one, we went out and found uh, some voice talent to do a voiceover for us so that we could get like that Kurzgesagt style voiceover. <laughs> I specifically asked the, the guy, can you do a Kurzgesagt voice? And he was like, yeah, I can do that. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm so happy with the result. But that's, that's an, ex an example of, of where we might have uh, put in a little bit of money. Not that it was super expensive. He was very generous. Right. Yeah, that's cool. But it's not like super expensive. Say like PyPI is really expensive to run if it weren't for the sponsors and the, the donations, right? Like $40,000 a month with bandwidth and stuff like that. Yeah, no, because like the, um, the majority of that bandwidth is, I guess, Discord is paying that. Right. And then right. we are not paying, you know, like it's free to run a community on Discord no matter how big it gets. Yeah, um, that's cool. So essentially... Uh, no, it's it's fairly cheap to 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 make ends meet here, and we try to put all the money that we get in straight back out to the community as prices or in, in giveaways or whatever we can, because we're not trying to like make money. We're just trying to to provide the best possible experience that we can for our users. Yeah, super cool. One thing that we talked about a little bit before we hit record that I think is interesting is you'd mentioned how some of the infrastructure and some of the ideas you get to apply and experiment with here are things that you can actually bring back to your a job mm, right yeah. where you wouldn't get a chance to say oh let's you know try this thing with kubernetes or whatever it is you're doing but you can try oh. it here and then if it works you're like oh yeah we tried this here's how it's working uh i think there's this interesting interplay between like work work your main professional um experience yeah. and then these kind of more free form places where you you have more control to do whatever you want yeah, we try to encourage that kind of thing. Like um, we were now we're thinking about doing a rewrite of our API into fast API. It's currently a Django RESTful API. Hmm. And the primary motivation for that is because uh, one of the owners needs to learn fast API for work. Yeah, sure. But that's a really good reason to do it. And of course, it gives us an extra benefit because it could use a rewrite, but it probably we wouldn't have done it unless we had someone who was sort of personally motivated. So yeah, in a way, I think especially at the top of like the executive leadership, we try to use Python Discord as sort of a sandbox to experiment with stuff and, and learn skills that we can take with us to work. Yeah, it gives uh, a lot of people experience with things that they otherwise might not get to touch because that API that they work on at work, it's been Django REST framework for five years and there's yeah. no reason to change it and they're not changing it because it works. Don't touch it. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. I learned Kubernetes from... Python Discord myself, and now I'm bringing it to work with me because we don't have uh, that kind of sophistication there quite yet. 
And um, and that's just one example. I, I've learned half of everything I know, I think, at Path and Discord because, of, of course, I'm in a unique position of being able to do pretty much whatever I want there. Yeah, um, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> I think I that's think the that... secret to being on the cutting edge is you find these places where you can try things out and mm -hmm. then you have that experience uh, for maybe to bring back to more conservative type of environments. Um, I think that this kind of way of... of uh, using the community has been mostly available to the owners uh, up until we grew to this size. And now I'm trying to sort of expand that to the rest of the staff and anyone who wants to get involved, like, please come and use us as a, as a way for you to learn that next thing that you're thinking about learning. Like we, maybe we can provide you an opportunity to uh, in really looking to get into uh, making uh, a great sounding audio. Maybe we have an opportunity for you to like hone your craft and practice. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's about it for uh, the time that we have to talk about Python Discord. But congratulations on such a cool community, you and everyone Thank else. You. I know it isn't just you. You're the the figurehead for the community, right? <laughs> Maybe in a way, because I have a freakishly large beard and uh, <laughs> there's a small cult of personality around my lemon nickname. We have, we have a whole set of emojis with lemons. Oh, nice. And, uh, <laughs> so it's sort of, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, we have a lot of really notable members of the community. Once you get to know them, it's so many great people involved. Uh, uh, so it's, it's just a wonderful place to be. Yeah, fantastic. All right, final two questions before I let you out of here. Uh, yes. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor are you using these days? So I use PyCharm. Um, and I use a little bit of VS code on the side when I need to do something really simple or whenever I want to do this code collab thing. Um, so PyCharm has code with me and there's the live sync thing on VS code where you can actually like yeah. live collaborate on files. I've been getting into that. It's really cool to work like two people live editing some code together. Um, and, um, uh, and PyCharm has been really good to me, uh, from day one. I, I just really fell in love with it since I started using it. It has so many features that I need, especially as, as a full stack developer who is into a lot of web stuff. And I work on, you know, JavaScript and HTML and, uh, I interact with databases a lot. So like, um, once you're thinking about writing, you know, PyCharm has native support for Django and Flask and, and can really make sense of a lot of these files in ways that the other editors would need plugins and stuff to do. Yeah. It just gets it's, so uh, much out I of the box. 100% agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very cool one. All right. And then notable PyPI packages. What do you want to give a shout out to there? Uh, uh, well, uh, we've, um, we've mentioned a couple of, um, of the, the stuff that we've made here at Python Discord. Um, I want to also mention that, um, uh, so maybe that's a little narcissistic of me to talk about my own packages when you ask me this, <laughs> it's all there's right. a lot of packages I really love out there, but you may not have heard of stuff like, uh, we have async Redis cache, yeah. uh, which is this, we found out that working with Redis from an asynchronous, um, uh, context can be a little complicated sometimes. So we made this, uh, PyPI package that makes it extremely trivial to work with Redis from for instance, a Discord bot. That's where we use it. So that if all you need to do is just cache some data in, in Redis so that you can access it later and you know, like use it as a cache the way most people do, this is a, a godsend for, for working with it in an asynchronous way. Um, then I also have a, a personal project that I've been working on a lot lately called Black Box. And the, uh, it's in reference to the black box inside of a plane. Okay. So like the idea is if there's a disaster, you get the black box and it has the stuff that you need to like figure out what happened and get back on track. Um, and so black box is a, a backup system. It's designed to be extremely easy to work with, like oh, abstract nice. away all the painful stuff. And it's also designed to be really easy to contribute to. I've been like working on trying to make the most contributor friendly thing I can do a uh, big fat read me, everything's like abstract classes. So if you want to contribute, you usually only have to touch a single file to write like uh, a single interface basically for the thing. So what it does is you uh, make a config file, you put connection strings into that config file. So say you want to uh, do a backup of Postgres. Well, you write a single string that's like Postgres colon slash slash the username, the password. And then um, you put that in there and now it knows how to talk to Postgres. It does all of that stuff for you. 
Um, then you, so now you've told it a couple of databases, say Postgres, Redis, MongoDB, whatever you've got. Then you tell it, where do you want to store that backup? Maybe you want to store it in an S3. Maybe you want to store it on Dropbox or something free like that. Well, then you just put in another connection string that describes how to talk to that service. And then lastly, maybe you want to be let know when that backup has been done. So then you can put in a, a Slack or a Discord um, a connection string, uh, and it'll send you a message and say, ah, oh, I'm done with my backup. So the, the goal is for people to just install it off of PyPI, and they can put it in a cron job or run it manually, and it'll just do the backup, store it somewhere in the cloud, and let you know when it's done. I love it. That's really cool. And looks like something maybe I could even make use of. I mean, I've got MongoDB, and I have backups for it, but this sort of fully automatic uh, stuff would be cool. Uh, I've already got a Slack channel where I get notifications for like deploys and yeah, whatnot. It could just throw in like, hey, we did a backup next to that, you know. Well, it's it's really easy to get started with. So if it, you know, like some people have like a, like expensive paid backup services, and they'll obviously be much better. Like saving a complete snapshot of the entire database um, server is going to be better than this. But if you're just looking for something quick and easy, maybe you just want to store it in. Uh, on a Dropbox or something, this is a great way to have like offsite backups for free and yeah. you can set it up in 10 minutes. Very cool. All right. Well, that's, that's quite neat though. Thanks for letting us know about that one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, the, the live chat is blowing up with uh, lemons <laughs> <laughs> and bot commands about your beard and things like that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone. But uh, mostly just appreciation from the community, I think. So very cool. So final call to action, people are interested in being part of your community. What do they do? Right. So they can go to pythondiscord.com or .org. And um, from there, you get all the information you need in order to join us. Uh, if There's also just discord.gg slash python, that's us. Or you can even find it in the Python subreddit. So once you get into the community, um, you, uh, you just ask around and we'll help you get started with whatever it is you want. Uh, you need help. There's help channels to ask and you join an event. There's lots of uh, cool stuff going to happen in the next uh, couple months. Get involved in Pi Week. It's really fun. You write a game. Uh, get involved in the Code Jam. It's a unique experience. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, just come, come hang out with us. It's really, it, it's a lovely place. That's cool. It sounds like uh, some of these programming examples and um, opportunities might be like, more low key, more uh, silly and fun rather than, you know, forms over data. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing what you guys are up to over there. And it's been great to chat with you. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Yeah. See you later. All right. Bye, Michael.